so this is a panel discussion. These are the panelists today. Um, the panel discussion was moderated by Professor Asha Kanwa. She is the president of COAL and a strong advocate for girls' education and for the empowerment of women. Um, she's been recognized multiple times through honorary doctorates for her work in this field, as well as in promoting open distance and flexible learning more broadly. Uh, Professor Kanwa will introduce all the rest of the panelists. So over to you, Professor Kanwa, and we can exit the slide share. Thank you, Tony. Uh, welcome to everyone. Today we have a really outstanding panel to discuss really an issue which is very important uh, as we try to you know, recover from the pandemic. Uh, let me introduce our distinguished panelists first. Uh, you can see the Do Honorable Dr. Unity Dow. She's in Botswana. Uh, she's a very famous human rights activist a lawyer, a former judge, and has been a minister several times over, including a minister of education and a minister of foreign affairs and international cooperation. Uh, she also has been a very strong advocate for girls' education, women's rights, and very well known in Africa uh, for precisely those reasons. So you are most welcome, Honorable Dr. Unity Dow. It's really a privilege to have you on the panel. Let me also introduce, uh, now from the Caribbean, another very iconic figure, uh, Priya Manikchand, who is the Minister of Education in Guyana. She's an attorney at law. And also, of course, she's been a minister Again, in the past, Minister of Human Services, now is the Minister of Education. And she's firmly committed to developing education, not just in Guyana, but in the entire Caribbean region, especially for women and girls. So welcome, uh, Minister Manikchan. We can't see you, but uh, have we lost the minister? Um, Then we've got uh, my colleagues. Uh, I have Francis Ferreira, who has so much experience in the Commonwealth. And uh, in fact, she was the first woman mayor in her home country, Namibia. She has been called specialist for Girls Inspire and has made a difference to the lives of thousands of women and girls by helping them develop skills so that child early and forced marriages were averted. So welcome, Francis. Thank you, sir. And then Tony Mays, who is my colleague in open schooling, uh, is also our editor of the Journal of Learning for Development, which is really going from strength to strength under his leadership. He's an expert in teacher education, distance learning, open schooling, and is making a difference to the lives of hundreds of thousands of children through Paul's Open Schooling Initiative. He again brings an African and a pan-Commonwealth perspective to this panel. So I think we've got a very good kind of uh, range of perspectives. And this is going to be a really enriching and important discussion. So let me just say a little bit uh, about uh, Paul's perspective. Welcome back, uh, Minister. You've been introduced, but at that time we lost you, but now I think uh, people can see you. So just a bit about Paul's position on this. You know that the Commonwealth of Learning is committed to promoting learning for sustainable development and women's equality and empowerment are central to that vision. So how do we achieve it? Paul uses distance learning and technologies, particularly to reach the unreached women and girls in developing countries. We all know that there's a huge digital divide across the world and we promote the use of technologies that are available, affordable and accessible. So we don't leave anyone behind. 
we also know that one size doesn't fit all. And if technologies have to be effective, they must be placed in an appropriate social, political, and economic context. We know very well that in uh, the poorest countries, women are 33% less likely to use the internet than men. And during this pandemic, we found that in sub-Saharan Africa, more than 60% learners were excluded from online learning. So, I mean, if we have to use technology options, we have to be mindful of this broader context. Now, let me also just, uh, you know, highlight two or three facts from uh, the impact that the pandemic has had on girls' education. Uh, the Malala Fund report, uh, the most recent one on July 13th said that more than 20 million secondary school age girls could be out of school after the COVID-19 crisis has passed. And we know that, that, you know, when the Ebola crisis hit uh, West Africa, then in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, the girls were less likely to return than boys and they didn't return. So how do we avert that? We know that this could happen. What can we do to avert it? The other uh, it, uh, startling fact is that after the pandemic, up to 1 million girls in sub-Saharan Africa may never go back to school because of pregnancy, all happening during this COVID-19. So that's another issue that we need to consider when we look for proposals going forward. The other thing which has happened is learning loss. Learning loss generally because of, and this is learning loss related to curriculum because of school closures. And studies show that it is expected that girls in lower, low and lower middle income countries are going to be disproportionately impacted due to this uh, uh, you know, learning loss that we are talking about. And last year, towards the end of last year, there is an NGO called Opportunity in Pakistan, which looked at the impact of COVID-19 on girls. And they, they found that, and the most concerning finding was the disparity in the parents' attitudes to sending girls back to school. Only 31% parents said that they would like to send the girls back to school as compared to 94% for boys. And then when the schools actually reopened, 60% of the girls didn't return. So all these are very alarming facts and we have to all complement and supplement each other's efforts to see what we can do to ensure that we are prepared to deal with this crisis. So with that, let me invite our panelists. I'll start with Tony first to set the general context, followed by the Honorable Dr. Unity Dow, followed by uh, Francis Ferreira and the Honorable Priya Manikchan. So Tony. Thank you, Prof. Um, colleagues, I'm going to ask another colleague of mine to share the screen because you know what happens when you do these things online, your laptop stops working properly. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking about sort of the broad perspective from an open schooling point of view. Um, next slide, please. Just to put the context, uh, reminding us what uh, Prof has just said, around 214 million children globally um, have had schooling disrupted in one way or another. But even before the pandemic, there were about 300 million children out of school in any case, um, with the majority of them being girls. Why is this so? Uh, next slide. So it, it, ra it raises the question of, of why it's so important that we get girls into school if they haven't had an opportunity before, or back into school if they've dropped out as a result of the pandemic or other reasons. Next slide. So partly it's an ethical issue. All children have the right to an education. It shouldn't matter what sex people are at birth or what their subsequent sexual orientation is as they grow up. They have a right to education. It's an ethical issue. Next slide. But even if 
you are not convinced by the ethical reasons that what is morally good, there is also an economic argument to be made. If we could have gender equality, all indications are that we could grow the world economy. Every country would benefit from having more girls and women actively involved. Furthermore, next slide. When we focus particularly on girls and women, there is a multiplier effect. We have a positive impact on lots of other issues at the same time. So for ethical and economic reasons, it is good for girls to complete schooling. So what are the barriers? Why is it that we're not achieving 100% girls in school and being successful? Next slide. Part of it is to do in some countries with traditions and ways of doing things and, and cultural norms. In many countries, girls are married fairly early. Um, and once they're married as, as young teenagers, they often do not get the opportunity to go back to school. So they, they miss out and then cannot become active participants in the economy. Next slide. We also have a problem in many Commonwealth countries that children have to work to help support the family. And this ha happens with both boys and with girls. If we don't address this issue, um, once those children grow up, they probably will not come back into schooling and will be always marginalized from the economy. Next slide. And that links to directly to questions of poverty. Um, if, you, if you don't have much income coming into the household, the cost of school uniforms, school fees, school transport, the opportunity cost of not being able to be in gainful employment, all of those can militate against children accessing schooling and girl children in particular. Many families in many countries will prioritize if they can only send one child to school, will send the boy to school rather than the girl. Next slide. We also have some logistical challenges. There are many schools that do not even have separate um, ablution facilities for girls, which obviously becomes highly problematic and a very, very big barrier towards girls accessing normal schooling. In addition, in many societies, girls are expected to help the mother and the parents in the household. So they have other duties to the family as well that militate them regularly attending school. Next slide. We also have a problem. Um, various studies have shown that a lot of the messages built into school textbooks are not conveying positive messages for girls and women. We need learning materials that show that women can be engineers, they can be astronauts, they can be science um, scientists. Um, so we need to look at the, the gender equality, the gender messages that are in content and curricula. Next slide. So is open schooling, are we able to help with open schooling in addressing these kinds of issues? Next slide. Yes, we can to some extent. Um, by using open distance learning methods, we can create greater access. Um, we can have more flexibility and choice about what to study, when to study, how quickly to study. We can, by regularly updating curriculum and content, improve quality. We can allow children to study at their own pace, maybe doing one subject at a time and writing it off instead of taking 10 subjects at the same time. And we can do something about the costs. Uh, generally, open distance learning provision is cheaper. And now, nowadays, what we're doing is instead of supplying expensive copyrighted textbooks, we're making the content available as open educational resources. Um, and increasingly, in many of the projects I'm working in, it is now cheaper to supply a tablet that is preloaded with digitally interactive OER. That is cheaper than actually supplying a whole pile of um, paper-based textbooks. But of course, it's not a question of one size fits all. What will work in one country will not necessarily work in another country. Next slide. So for example, in India, we have the largest open school in the world, the National Institute of Open Schooling. 
uh, they have embraced technology um, very widely. Um, in one of their massive open online courses, as you can see here, in one single cohort, they trained 1.4 million school teachers. So once you once you have people having access to technology and open educational resources, there's great potential for scale. But obviously not every country has the connectivity and the devices to be able to work in that way. So next slide. In other places, we're using more traditional methods. So for example, in Kenya towards the end of last year, to help out of school children, to help children in school who were struggling, we put together over a thousand short videos um, on different topics in the school curriculum we broadcast them on television, reaching, we think, about 150,000 learners at any one time. And then we backed them all up onto YouTube. And the last time I checked, um, after four months, over 35,000 children and teachers had also accessed the backup videos. But sometimes we can't do that either. Next slide. In another project that I just had in Nigeria, um, we actually had to go out into the community. We went out on motorbike. We used narrow casting technology, solar powered narrow casting technology. You can maybe be able to see the speaker in the tree there to go to communities to call the children to come and to engage with them about what their learning needs are and to give them a bit of fun to show that you can come back into schooling and it can be quite fun. So there's no one size fits all. There are lots of different ways in which we can use open schooling to support children and particularly girls who are not in school for various reasons. But unless we, unless we address those underlying challenges, um, we're not going to, to be able to um, reach all the children. So open schooling is one part of the problem, one part of the solution, but that we have to look at the bigger socioeconomic issues as well. Next slide. One of the things that we are finding is that as we move into open distance learning and particularly using technology, this has increasingly become a preferred option for some children with disabilities because uh, many of our schools were not designed, many of our day schools were not designed to accommodate children with disabilities, and so open distance learning can be one way of opening access for them as well. Next slide. If you'd like to read more about this, um, this presentation is based on chapter eight in our new open schooling book, uh, which we published in December uh, last year. Next slide. And then finally, um, if as a result of the discussions that we have in this, in this webinar, in this panel discussion, if you think there's an opportunity for Cole to support your work in getting girls back into school, please contact me after um, and I'll send you a proposal a template and we can discuss possibilities for working together. So thank you very much and back to Professor Kanua. Thank you, Tony. Uh, for that um, overview of uh, what are the barriers that prevent girls from accessing education and what are some of the solutions. And you are proposing open schooling. Now, we know that open schooling has always responded to the needs of the hour. For example, in the early days, you know, in the prairies in Canada or in remote homesteads in Australia, people had no schools in the neighborhood for miles and miles. So how did they educate their children through open schools, you know, which meant that they received instructional materials in print form and the parents helped the students. Now that was a constraint of geography at that time, you know, and distance. But today when everything had to close down this again, you know, we've come full cycle and people have had to parents and siblings have had to help, you know, children access education, everybody is not connected to uh, technology. Everybody uh, doesn't have uh, highly educated parents. And yet somehow, you know, the people did whatever they could to ensure that uh, learning continued in whatever form they could. So I think the main point which comes out is that in the past, um, 
open schooling was there as a, it had a social mission, you know, addressing issues of social justice, reach, reaching people who could not be otherwise reached through, uh, you know, physical schools. Now, today, it's going to be another um, opportunity for us, especially when girls are on the verge of dropping out because open schools are more flexible. They cost less. In some countries, for example, in India, they cost about one tenth of what it costs to put a child through a government supported secondary school. In Namibia, it costs one fifth. So the cost is definitely affordable. It's flexible. You can study on weekends. You can study in the evening. You don't have to go to a physical school. And it's also good quality, as we can see from the learning outcomes and other kind of quality parameters. So I think this is a viable option, especially when resources are going to be scarce going forward. This could be a potential uh, solution for us. Uh, so I think the point to take away from here is that here is one possible option which is an alternative approach to brick and mortar institutions. So on that note, let me invite the Honorable Dr. Unity Dow for her presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Ann Kanwa for that, for that invitation. Um, in, in thinking about the issue of how would you get girls into school, how do you ensure that they remain in school, and how do you, you know, promote their return to school in the event that they drop out? I started thinking about um, really asking like three questions, um, really based on my experience in being on board of schools and also my experience as uh, when I was the Minister of Education here in Botswana. Um, and the first question is, where and when are girl children unsafe? And the second question is, what is the nature of the harm they are exposed to? And thirdly, how does that harm affect their getting back to school? And, or, and when they're in school, in remaining in school, and if they drop out, returning to school? I will no doubt, you know, talk, you know, or touch on some of the things that um, Tony Mays spoke about, um, but the first, where and when are girls unsafe? I, I think we can all accept that generally the safest space for children during the day is in school. There are many poor schools, many not so great schools, and, uh, um, and of course there'll be the occasion, um, occasionally when harm will befall to a child in school, but in the majority of cases, or uh, the majority of educators around the world are professionals who actually do educate, who guide, and I think very importantly, supervise you know, children. You know, um, so they provide um, that supervision that is uh, necessary. And I think uh, it, is, it is my experience that homes, especially homes uh, that are financially deprived, can be very boring spaces and engaging spaces with the result that children go into the streets. And that is really where I say, you know, uh, it is a space between the home, you know, and the school. There's a dangerous space for children, literally the streets. You know, uh, when during lockdown, you see children loitering in the streets, you know, adult entertainment places. Um, vehicles, kids are driven back to school in, in private vehicles, in buses, in, in, in taxis. And as a Minister of Education, I was surprised the extent to which actually these actually terribly unsafe spaces, you know, for children. Um, when do we see the greatest harm, you know, to children? I say it is generally during really two areas, one during transitioning from one segment of education to the other. We find that, you know, from my experience, is the transition from primary to junior school, junior secondary, that's actually unsafe. Transition from junior to secondary to senior, unsafe. Transition to senior and, and tertiary, unsafe. And um, wh why, you know, um, why is this so? I, I think transitions, you know, um, 
we forget, I mean, like transitions generally are marked by celebration for some activity. Doesn't matter what it is, whether you're getting married, whether, you know, any transition in life, you know, is going to be marked by some uh, special activity. What is a 12 year old who is so pleased, chaffed with herself that she did great in, you know, in primary schools, going next year to junior secondary school, what, how does she celebrate this? I don't think, you know, we haven't think about the extent to which actually happiness celebration, you know, uh, can actually lead to harm if it is not organized, if there's no safe space to actually to, to, um, to end up doing this. The 16 year old who's going to uh, senior school next year, it's more likely to feel so happy with herself that she's going to go to the local bar, you know, um, because there isn't any spaces for children outside homes, especially in poor neighborhoods, you know, that they can do, um, the, they can celebrate their successes, be happy about themselves. Um, but then the second um, area, space of unsafe space with children is during school holidays. In many of the Commonwealth countries, school holidays are very long. Um, if you are in a poor neighborhood, you know, it's a generally unsupervised time for a whole month, a month and a half sometimes, and they're totally unengaged. Young people will find something to do. And if there's no space, safe space for them to do those things, they will find themselves in, you know, uh, in unsafe places. And therefore, it's not, it's not uh, surprising that um, school closures you know, will lead, you know, um, to children falling within the cracks and never going back. And, you know, what are the most, you know, um, common types of harm that you fall children who are not in school? It's pregnancy, we already know that. Illness. I was surprised when I was at the Ministry of Education to find how many kids don't come back to school because they were just ill. You know, a broken leg can actually lead a child to never go back to school. You know, um, an illness maybe brought on by maybe an unhealthy, you know, lifestyle or just really simple illness. Of course, you know, other behavior like alcohol use or drug use. But also, you know, and I think uh, Tony touched on this, really is caretaking. You see, you know, have, you know uh, taking care of, suddenly a child is available for longer than a, a, a week. And suddenly then there's been a chore, a task. And then the family almost cannot afford to let her back to go to back go back to school. They're so used to her actually filling that little gap or that you know huge gap. Maybe it's not so so little, you know. Um, and then you know I, I I often I used to uh, when I was means of education compared to an, a volunteer or an intern who comes to work for you. You didn't think you needed a third hand at all, but suddenly they become so useful that you don't you know you even are offering them another job to stay on. So I think often girls who stay out of school for too long end up actually being, you know, little mothers, so to speak. And therefore the family doesn't feel that they can actually, um, they, they feel so comfortable or they feel so like, you know, they plug this hole that they, um, they didn't realize existed before. So I think it's important to realize that um, all kids end up doing other jobs or they just become, you know, um, so, become uninterested in school, uninterested in school because they end up doing something else. You know, and there's no push for them to go back, they will not go back. Um, so of course, so kids who drop out of school, then of course they've got a young one to take care of. You know, they've got the cost, you know, uh, implication of that. And, um, you know, if the uh, caretaker responsibilities are firmed up and therefore the child is never really allowed anymore to go back, you know, and, uh, and the, the question for me is, what are the opportunities here? And I think, you know, um, first of all, I'm really focusing a lot of my attention in how once they are in school, how do we ensure they remain in school so that we, you know, we limit having to go out to and reach them when they're out of school. So how do we promote remaining in school? I really think that if we look at traditional schools, they are run from facilities that lie unused for one quarter of the day, every day, all weekends, and all holidays. These are fast expensive facilities across the world that really are used for very little, you know, because schools do close. So the question is, you know, um, can we use, or can we piggyback open learning onto existing brick schools so that it's part of the policy of government to actually make sure that education will be within bricks, but also we will collapse these walls to make sure that we reach kids even from that so that 
a school does not call itself only a school if it's only offering um, day, day learning. Mm -hmm. And school holidays, like I said, pose a serious danger to girls. So I guess I think engaging girls during holidays can limit their fear to return to school. Again, open and online engagement during school holidays. I think it's very important because then um, they continue, they, they have something interesting. It doesn't have to be homework because kids were doing work for three months. They don't want to do it again during their summer, you know, or their winter or whatever break. Can we have programs that actually reach kids in, in entertaining kids so that they, they actually want to log on? not to learn, but to play, to be entertained, and therefore to have a link between school and, and, and home during holidays. And I think it's very important to have an intentional transition management and guidance, you know, for girls as they transition from one segment of education to another. Again, this can be done, you know, in school, but also open and online really programs, curricula that we develop and say, you know, how do you, you know, um, uh, engage young girls um, to facilitate that transition. And lastly, really is the obvious one, the greater collaboration between education and social services. Mm -hmm. I think in many countries, there's a really disconnect between, you know, that if you're not in school, then you are somebody else's problem. And so really, I think a greater collaboration between these two segments. I thank you very much. I'm sorry, I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you, Professor. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Dr. Unity Dow. I think you've made some very important points that, Yes, school, open school is an answer, but I think it's not replacing the physical brick and mortar structure, which is very important. And we've learned the importance of that during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, those schools are providing safe spaces for children who otherwise have nowhere else to go. And you know, in some countries like India, they're also providing nutrition because the, they have a midday meal scheme. And that's the only good meal that they get in the whole day when they go to school. So it's, of course, very important for the social interaction with other children, feeling safe and, you know, being part of childhood. That is very important. And another thing which came out during this pandemic is this whole uh, need for focusing on mental health and well-being of everyone, teachers mm -hmm. and children. We have never bothered about it in the past. You know, we just looked at cognitive abilities in schools. Uh -huh. But this uh -huh. is an issue which came out more importantly now. And the other thing is that how do we actually empower children, you know, to stay in school? You raised that question. Now, in some countries, they are providing bicycles to girls. And the studies show that when the girls have bicycles, they feel more empowered. The attendance goes up. And they are not harassed by boys on their way to school because then they speed up and get there faster. So, you know, there, there are initiatives taking place which help girls to stay in school. But uh, the other question which you raised about, you know, what, how can we use distance learning now um, going forward? And I think it's a very important solution to this whole issue of learning loss. You know, in the past in Pakistan, when they had an earthquake, and uh, for three months, the schools were closed. And when mm -hmm. children came back to school, uh, the teachers continued as if it was business as usual. And the learning mm -hmm. loss, which they measured was one and a half years. Mm -hmm. But in cases where there is a targeted approach to providing remedial classes to make up for the learning loss, people found a great deal of kind of benefit. So I think let us use open and distance learning as that remedial bridge between mm -hmm. the learning loss and the return to school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hadn't thought about it, but your question made me think about it. So I think this becomes an answer that even when we have brick and mortar schools, and the other point is that learning doesn't have to take place, you know, within a certain time frame, between nine to two or whatever. The mm -hmm. pandemic has shown us it can happen any time of night or day. So mm -hmm. within the class, outside the class, and if we are going to have that kind of, you know, 24-7 uh, learning opportunity, then distance learning becomes the answer. So with that, let me invite Honorable Priya Manikchan for her intervention. Honorable Minister, you are muted as yet. Hello, good morning. Um, I am also getting help with the screen sharing because I'm bound to be somewhere 
at page one and find myself at page 10. Um, so I'm getting help with Godfrey, who's right next to me. I'm very glad we're having this particular forum. Um, the school closures have been extremely hard on, on the world's children and definitely hard on us here in Guyana. And we have learned a couple of lessons. We've done more than we've ever done before um, to engage children outside of the classroom. Traditionally, we have only ever for the history of our country engaged our children through um, teacher in front of the classroom, children seated, seated in benches. And so it was a real challenge. And in fact, for about five months after um, we closed schools, we did nothing. Every, it was almost like deer in headlights. The, the system did not respond at all. Um, suffice it to say, we were also in an extended election period and that did not help because everything else collapsed around um, trying to get an elected government in place. So from then to now, we've made so many interventions regarding um, how we could deliver education on it through distance means. And we have done this through television. We have done this, this through online platforms like Zoom and Google Classroom and even WhatsApp and Facebook messages. We have created worksheets. We have uh, taught on the radio. We have done all of that. And I would venture to say with these that we did more here in Guyana than any other country in these parts of the world, um, in this part of the world did in the Caribbean region, South America, Latin America. But uh, we also see very clearly how with all of that effort and uh, quite a bit of expenditure, we just had mock examinations for our grade six, that's the exit exam from primary to secondary. And with all of those interventions, we still saw from mock exam one, 2,600 children missing. These are 10 and 11 year olds and they had the option of taking this exam at home. So it's not as though parents were afraid to send them into schools. And we still saw um, results that were so poor, I wanted to lock my door and cry. I'm nowhere near there as yet. <laughs> I'm just chatting for now. <laughs> I haven't started my presentation as yet. I'm just saying that it was very clear to us that we have not, um, we cannot, even with the best of intention and all the resources, reform from what we know and what we've become accustomed to into um, distance education effectively um, to meet our children so that they get uh, the quality of education they need in this time. And so that's just an observation to begin with. We also partnered with, in this time with Profituro to train all, not some, 100% of our teachers in the usage of ICT and innovative means. Um, I'm not sure who's familiar with Profituro. Uh, and then we partnered with the um, providers of cellular and data so that any usage on those platforms would expend nothing from the teachers. Mm -hmm. Even with all of that, we still see some serious gaps in the delivery of education. I will begin now. So um, uh, I, I can't, one moment, please. So yes, but I can't read that because this is here. Sorry. Globally, it has been recognized that an investment in the education of girls goes well beyond merely correcting the gender inequality imbalance and has significant national developmental benefits. In Guyana, we have embraced the fact that the education of girls impacts the age of initial childbirth and the number of children conceived, the value of education passed on to future generations, the earning capacity of women in our society and their degree of social participation within the society among other significant benefits. 
More importantly, addressing the needs of girls requires approaches that go well beyond the traditional schooling experiences. Even further, the existing pandemic has brought the issues around girls' education into sharp focus. The Guyana, <clears throat> the Guyana experience. Like our sister territories in the Caribbean, our experience regarding girls' education differs from some other parts of the world. Where, where girls are denied access and are marginalized from the educational processes. Our reality is defined by the number of girls enrolled in education exceeding that of the boys on many levels, even at tertiary. Beyond that, the performance of females has outstripped that of their male counterparts for a considerable period and is expected to continue. This has led us to investigations into the phenomenon called the feminization of education within our jurisdictions. Taken on the surface, this might suggest that the experiences of girls in our society is devoid of issues and challenges. The existing reality, however, is that we have had to delve way beyond the superficial appearances to develop a deeper understanding of where sociocultural, socioeconomic, political, and other issues create structural barriers to the effective education of girls. In this presentation, I will highlight some of our findings and some strategies devised to date to address issues within this context. The social realities of our time dictate the need to be considerably flexible and responsive to changing needs around girls' education. One of our most significant findings is that many of the realities are highly contextual and demand responses that emphasize relevance and suitability. The following factors are considered significant to the educational experience of girls, traditionalism and the urban rural divide, social ills such as teenage pregnancy and gender-based violence, menstruation and its related contextual realities, socioeconomic and geographic factors. Regarding the traditionalism and urban rural divide in many parts of our society, traditional concepts regarding gender roles persist. The practice of teenage marriage, though not prevalent, still impacts perceptions of girls as well as the age of initial sexual engagement. Girls continue to be subjected to traditional domestic demands that sometimes adversely affect their educational roles and responsibilities. And before I move on, particularly in this lockdown where parents had to work, we saw that the older girls and, you know, older is such a relative term, but the, the girls in the home had the responsibility of looking after the younger sibling, siblings, and so their online schooling was seriously affected. Social ills. Our country is still affected by a high rate of teenage pregnancy. A Ministry of Public Health 2018 situation analysis, analysis placed Guyana among the top three highest rates in the region, with 90 out of 1,000 girls, 15 to 19 year olds, giving birth during the 2010 to 2015 period. Gender-based violence against girls continues to be an issue within the education system, reflecting pervasive patterns within our society. The first comprehensive national survey conducted by the UN in 2019 on gender-based violence revealed that Guyana, that in Guyana, more than half, 55% of all women experienced at least one form of violence. Menstruation and related contextual realities. A recent study that we conducted here within the last, I think, six weeks indicated that girls' menstrual cycle have negatively impacted their educational experiences on various levels. Among the prevailing issues are their access to sanitary pads, physical and emotional distress, and cultural dynamics affecting their treatment during their menstrual cycles, as well as inflexible school rules and regulations. Socioeconomic and geographic factors. In many of our poorest enclaves, 
Decisions are made that oftentimes steer girls away from education. In the deep hinterland and riverine regions, the commencement of formal education is adversely affected due to factors such as distance and the modes of accessing school. Interventions. Due to the displacing effects of COVID-19 and other issues identified, numerous inventive interventions have been conducted to facilitate the continued education of girls, as well as the reintegration of teenage mothers. Health and family life skills for life training and care packages for adolescent mothers adversely affected by COVID in hinterland regions. Psychosocial support for COVID related issues such as stress, grief, fear, anxiety, depression, anger, and suicide in various regions. A national campaign for free distribution of sanitary napkins to students is being devised as we speak. Provision of hot meals, boats, bicycles, shoes, and school uniform, uniforms to support education is underway. Distribution of worksheets and study materials for all students at all levels of the education system. The introduction of pedagogical and curricular approaches aimed at addressing learning loss at all levels. And recently, the introduction of a cash grant for every student across the country uh, to assist. It was not meant for COVID, but it has um, really come in well during this period where many have lost jobs because of the pandemic and um, prices have gone up like they have all across the world. In conclusion, we are committed to improving the experience of girls in education by devising various strategies for improving the quality of education offered across all levels of the system in Guyana. In addition, we continue to work to ascertain and address any gender specific issues impacting their educational experiences. I thank you. I'd be happy to do two things answer any questions in and around these, but also to share some of the material or any or all of the material we have created over the last six months for television, for worksheets or for any other. And we have radio um, instruction on those forms. We'd be happy to share it with any country that needs it. Um, and we have very similar curricula in many of these countries, especially in this region. And we would be glad to um, transfer that, that information and knowledge that we have acquired over the last few months, if it's required. Thank you, Honorable Thank you. Minister, for that uh, absolutely interesting and uh, insightful presentation. Um, it's good to know the practical steps which you are taking. And you know, my question is that, um, is it because you know these things at first hand, being a woman yourself, that you've got into, you know, the specifics of exactly what girls need, you know, like hot meals, sanitary pads, bicycles, and so on, uh, which, is, which is going to really make a, a small step, but will make a huge difference to girls' education in the country. And so, I Professor, here's the thing. <clears throat> and I say this with deep shame. I did not realize until we did the research recently and the survey just how affected girls are when they're on their period. We, the, the numbers were staggering that girls lose three to five days every month. And when you multiply that across 12 months, and I'm not talking about a few, I'm talking about a large enough number to, to cause me great worry. And I'm female and I get my period and I have had it in, in school and I did not realize these were some of the impacts um, because of different circumstances. Um, Mr. Mays raised earlier, if you'd, one of the issues was how comfortable do you feel changing your sanitary napkin in the facilities that are provided at the school? And because they didn't feel these are teenagers, they're adolescents, they're already going through so much, they didn't feel comfortable making those changes because of the facilities that are provided. And then just access to sanitary napkins and to enough to have the change that is the frequent changes that are required. So I, I didn't realize it and I'm right here, I'm female. I should have known that, I should have done better. 
um, until we, we actually did a poll on this because I started seeing some um, questions in and around it. And the first lady of Guyana started a national program, well, where she said she was talking to some girls and this came up as an issue. And so she started a national program to help fund sanitary napkins for all high school girls continuously. You know, I'm so glad we are talking about it because in many traditional societies in the Commonwealth, you know, this whole business of menstruation period, sanitary napkins is sort of, you know, swept under the carpet and kept, you know, behind closed doors. So now people are making films about it. People are talking about it. And I think uh, we, we are moving towards a kind of, you know, solution. But the other issues which you raised uh, in this a particular presentation were which were not raised before is about gender-based violence, uh, which of course, Honorable Unity Dow mentioned about, you know, safe, safe spaces and how children are not in safe spaces if they're out of school. Uh, the other is about boys under performance, which is a very uh, specific uh, issue related to the Caribbean, to Pacific and Southern Africa, some of the small states. And what we can do to actually ensure that we take the underperforming boys along as well through targeted approaches. Another issue which you raised was uh, about uh, authentic assessments, you know, uh, that one of the big casualties in this whole uh, pandemic was how do we actually assess and evaluate performance offline, you know, because we do proctored exams in schools. Now, suddenly we were left without any of those options. So that's another area where we need to rethink what we do. And the final point which came out was what you said about relevance, that how relevant is our schooling? Because everybody is not going to university after secondary school. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing which Tony is doing is, you know, uh, strengthening the vocational stream in secondary education through open schooling so that, you know, that becomes a terminal stage and people can go for livelihoods after um, the secondary school is over because they have the vocational skills which do equip them for livelihoods. So I think with that, um, we'll keep it for the further discussion. Uh, anything from you uh, now, Francis, uh, let me invite you. And then I'll invite Honorable uh, uh, Dr. Dow. My life's so screen sharing. Good morning. Good evening. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Kanwar. Um, it's always difficult to come in in the end. Uh, and to decide what to drop and what not to drop from what you originally planned to say, because some of the things were said already. And I think I will just go with what I originally planned to say, and it will fit into what some people already has mentioned. Education for girls um, is more than just access. It is about feeling safe in the classroom, supported in subjects and careers of their choice. In other words, it means gender equality should be central in the teaching and learning environment, the curriculum, the learning resources, including active involvement of communities. Uh, where is this thing? Uh, girls' education and support to women and girls is at the center of the work that I am doing here at the Commonwealth of Learning. And before I provide suggestions on how we can bring girls back to school, I thought to pause and provide context for where my contribution is situated. Over the past five years, we have been working with NGOs to provide livelihoods and skills training, as well as reintegrating girls into school. This project, Calls Girls Inspire, placed an emphasis on reaching underserved women and girls in communities across Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, Tanzania, uh, and Mozambique. Uh, for these women and girls, 
formal education may not be always available or an option for them to complete or maintain focus. Our main focus was to empower them and providing them with support to return to school. Very important, uh, the president earlier mentioned about skills uh, after school or part of the school. Uh, so there is, they can move back to school or from school, they can go to tertiary institutions where they do technical skills. Uh, our specific focus was providing life skills, livelihood skills, and also reintegrating them into schools. As you can see from the data, we followed a holistic approach, working not only with women and girls, but also with communities, including men and boys, prospective employers. And the statistics speak for itself, but I want to draw your attention to the number of community members which we have reached because I want to come back to that theme. I also want to draw your attention to the number that we have reintegrated back into schools as well as the community mentorship clubs established. So the challenge that we are here, the reason that we are here today is because of this challenge that out of all those millions out of school, 129 million are girls. And that, is, that challenge was further exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, but that was not the only thing that COVID-19 did. Girls dropped, more girls dropped out of school because being vulnerable to gender-based violence, child marriage, child labor, and early pregnancy. And these issues were mentioned before, but it was even more intense during COVID. But that is not the only thing COVID did. COVID also exposed the significant gender gaps in women's and girls' rights and revealed the inequities uh, of the system in a new light. And these would be access to justice, uh, discriminatory laws, restrictions on legal capacity of women, the gender-based digital divide, lack of women in leadership in decision-making positions, and lack of access to health services. Those were the things. But COVID also gave us the opportunity to address the weaknesses in the system. However, to truly transform the education system and to bring girls back to school, we should use a gender equality lens. Gender is intersectional. It is impacted by many other social issues. It's not only gender in isolation. So how can we get girls back to school? Uh, Professor Kanwar also referred to girls on bicycles. This specific image is one of girls who are advocating for bringing girls back to school in a village in Pakistan as part of the work that we are doing at the Commonwealth of Learning. In my opinion, the departure point to get girls back to school is the community. Those of us who are coming from earlier generations would remember how important the community was in our education. The space, as Dr. Dow said, between the house and going to school was not as dangerous many, many, many decades ago because the community were the caretakers. They took care of, people, of the girls as they moved from one place space to the other space. We know that social norms shape acceptable roles, opportunities, and behaviors for women and men in society and the household. And these gender stereotypes are deeply entrenched in the communities. And our experience with the Girls Inspire project was that the community mobilization increased the understanding in the communities of the negative effects of child marriage, of not sending girls to school, and it also increased their understanding of the benefits of sending girls back to school. This image is from a village in Malawi where we spoke to communities and girls as to bringing those girls sitting there back into school. In our work then, we had targeted messages for the community leaders, the parents, and other, using various media, including street theater, advocacy campaigns, and community meetings establishing community support groups to ensure that they support and monitor the girls' attendance. We developed a guide for community mentoring to ensure the collective support in communities. As you could see from my first slide, we established over 360 community mentorship clubs. 
In God's new six-year plan, we will continue to work with policymakers, local, authority, community, local authorities, communities, families, and traditional leaders, very important part of the rural communities, traditional leaders, to increase awareness of gender equality and to bring about changes in dominant social norms. Sorry. <clears throat> the next one uh, is to ensure that girls are safe in schools. As we can see, 246 million, according to UNICEF, children experience violence in and around school every year. And in my further reading, I found that 60 million girls per day across the world are exposed to gender-based violence. So the second action is really to ensure that the schools are safe spaces and, as an, and use that safe space as an incentive to bring girls back to school. The image here is where we are training school boards and teachers in Malawi about gender-based violence and gender equality to ensure that they are aware of this. We work with school boards, parents and teacher associations, victim support units, mothers groups, traditional authorities, head teachers, teachers, and very importantly, the girls and boys who are dropping out from school are part of the discussion. So we train them on the government's readmission policy uh, because in many countries, while there is a readmission policy for girls who fell pregnant and dropped out of school, many teachers do not know how to deal with it. Many school management, they do not know how to do, deal with it. The girls are supposed to come back in a safe environment, but they come back to a hostile and judgmental environment. And those are the issues that need to be dealt with. It doesn't help to have a re admission policy, and then that policy doesn't have a protection for those girls uh, when they come back. So safe spaces. So due to our involvement, there is this example in the training teachers and school boards on the readmission policy. Two students from the primary school in Malawi, uh, 15 and 16 years respectively, the, the girl uh, got pregnant and the parents started arranging uh, for the two of them to get married. But because of the involvement of our concerned, of, of our partner in, in Malawi, um, concerned youth organization, because of their involvement and in explaining uh, that to the family that there are legal and human rights implications for getting these two children married. That marriage was averted. The boy was allowed back in school. The girl was then after the birth of the baby, she, she participated in our skills training. And once the baby is stronger enough, she plans to go back to school. If it wasn't for this type of work, she wouldn't have had that opportunity. The next one that I'm suggesting is scaling up gender sensitive ODR. I'm focusing on the word gender sensitive because we have had ODL for as long as I can remember. And recently because of COVID and because of focusing our attention on gender-based violence, we have to be conscious and we have to change this language here. To ensure the provision of gender sensitive ODL, it is important to understand that women and girls face unique barriers. COVID has given us an opportunity to better understand the gender differences in access and learning in distance education. We should be considered to improve gender responsive distance education. I've listed here relevant technology. Previous speakers have talked about it as the first criteria when we consider gender sensitive ODL. Marginalized girls will have less access. Professor Kandrawa mentioned that already. Uh, Dr. Dow spoke at length about the safety of girls in spaces. Now, one such space is the online space. It is critical to incorporate digital safeguarding for girls. Two thirds of the world school age children or 1.3 billion age three to 17 do not have internet connection. So large part of the rural networks are also not connected by a mobile broadband. This picture I borrowed from the news agency and you can see in this picture is in Sri Lanka where 
school children with their teacher walked long distances and they had to go very high up. You can see they sit in a tree where they had to make makeshift sort of place where they are sitting, where they now can connect to the internet. So it is not always the, the, the solution to go high tech because of the challenges. Again, it has implications for the safety as they walk there, as they sit there. There are so uh, many things. The other thing that I have here is the time of broadcasting. In our work, we travel a lot to visit our partners, to monitor our work, to have negotiations with governments and, and, and all our partners. And I remember sitting in one of the countries, I will not mention the country, 5 a.m. in the morning at the airport waiting for a flight out. And what did I see on the television screen? A school lesson. Lessons were offered that time of the morning. Now, another time I was in the hotel, 2 a.m., same thing. So I was thinking, for whom are they showing these lessons? So the time of broadcasting lessons should be consulted with the, the users of it. So I will skip some of the things that I have there because this is a very important one. Involve girls and make their voices heard. Because this brings me to the point that I said, we should discuss it with them. When do you want to watch the TV? What is the convenient time? When making policies that affect girls, it is important to hear their perspective. An example is the readmission policy for teenage girls. While it was introduced in Malawi in 1993, it failed to bring girls back to school because it did not address the challenges faced by teenage mothers. It was reviewed in 2016 with major involvement of women rights organizations. And that is why in our work uh, in the next six years, we will work extensively with women rights organizations to support our work. I've mentioned mentoring earlier, but another level of mentoring is focused on developing leadership among school going and college and university girls. We started the Commonwealth Wise Women Mentorship Initiative. Uh, and we are working with eminent women leaders, mentoring young women, mentoring school going and university going girls and to build their leadership so that they can become advocates for, girl, advocates for girls education. The picture here, the image is of girls in Bangladesh, which they call themselves the traveling troops who are going around the villages and speaking to communities and parents to propagate for education for girls. I'm nearly done. Uh, when Namibia gained its independence in 1990, they had a skewed education system and thousands of out of school youth as well as thousands more who dropped out of school for some or other reason. Conscious of the fact that youth is the future of any country, the education authorities were adamant that access should be broadened to educate the thousands of out of school and unemployed youth. So for school level, the Namibian College of Open Learning was established and to date, to date, 742,001 <laughs> students went through the system. I just got the data this morning. Uh, I have some affinity for this organization because I was the founding director. 65.5% of the students are female and 34.5. This is the average over the past uh, 25 years. They turned 25 this year. I cannot imagine what would have happened to these youth if they didn't have this opportunity to go through open schooling. On the screen, you see some of the publications uh, that the Commonwealth of Learning has uh, published. You can, uh, Tony talked about right in the middle, the one that the most recent one, 12 years ago, uh, on the very right hand side, I wrote a, in the concluding chapter, which is called titled The Bright But Challenging Future of Open Schooling. I said at that stage uh, that there is not enough evidence to advance the open schooling agenda and to counter prejudices and misconceptions about open schooling that prevail among key stakeholders and policymakers. But today, 12 years later, I can assure you that there is a plethora of documented evidence to counter any prejudice. Call has various resources to support the establishment of open schools and to support them to provide quality uh, education, including using open education resources. In conclusion, last year we published 
this policy brief and these are some of the recommendations that we have made for policymakers ensure gender analysis and sex desegregated data in policy and program development i think that is the most important one if we want to look at transforming the system using a gender equality lens thank you madam chair thank you francis uh, but you know why we've got this resource on the screen just to say that you know call has a lot of resources on its website and they're all free please use them please reach out to tony and to francis if you need any further help or information but i think uh, what uh, the main point which francis has actually highlighted is and this is related to how to get girls back to school is to reach the communities you know the communities can be a big barrier to sending the girls back to school so if you have the com religious leaders community leaders and Another person that can be very influential in bringing girls back to school is the empowered mother. You know, unless the mothers are empowered in the house to understand the value of the of girls' education, it will be very difficult to girl, bring the girls back into education. So I, I think empowering mothers will be a key to that. Uh, another thing which Francis raised, which was not raised earlier, was this issue of cyber security and cyber safety. Since everything is going online, there's a lot of kind of harassment of girls and others on, on happening online. How do we actually prepare both teachers and students to be aware of all these kinds of dangers lurking um, on the internet? And the other uh, the point which I think was very important was about uh, uh, appropriate technologies. You saw those children sitting in a kind of, you know, treetop thing trying to get um, connected. Uh, in many countries, people have used, you know, loudspeakers, community radio, um, and others to reach students where, and even basic phones, basic mobile phones. So everything didn't have to be smartphone or smart device related. But people did come up with creative solutions and hats off to the teachers and parents and ministers who actually made these things happen. Uh, so with that, now let me uh, go back to the panel. Uh, Minister uh, uh, Honorable Priya Manikchan, there was a question for you uh, from the chat um, you know, audience. Minister, are you there? Well, while we wait for the minister, Minister Dao, um, Dr. Dao, can you please uh, give your kind of perspective from the discussion so far? Thank you very much. Um, really interesting perspectives. Um, when the, the comment about you know culture and also the comment about about really making schools a place for girls as well you know so that it's not just a place for boys and then you add girls you know um you know, anyway it made me sanitary pets people donating donate sanitary pads you know for for schools and i made the comment that i've never received toilet paper you know for example you know or tissue paper you know how come something so fundamental to hygiene that you've forgotten all these years to budget for that and we think it's something extra that people must donate to schools you know um so in so, why isn't just obvious that the culture of schools, the culture of all environments has to be the culture that's accommodating both boys and girls, you know, and looking at their special needs and responding to that. So I think that's for me, it's, it's very important. But the other thing also, somebody talks about multiple pathways or, or this, um, talking about vocational training, for example, you know, I, I often make the point that my great great grandmother, by the time she was 14, I'm sure had had the education that uh, so that uh, facilitated and empowered to um, participate in her community at that time. 
But here, you know, after 13 years of education, we 18 year olds come out and prepare to be accountable, productive, you know, participants, you know, in the um, in the environment. So we are doing something wrong if we can actually house a child for 13 years and she comes out, you know, hardly able to actually participate in, in at least some form of economy. So therefore, multiple pathways to be introduced as early as possible. I think it's important. Somebody talked about the possibility of doing that online, you know, and and in an open manner. So thank you very much. That's my comment. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Dow. Um, uh, Minister Manik Chand, are you there? I am. I am very okay. here. Uh, uh, well, good to hear your voice again, uh, Minister. There was a question from somebody saying that, can you say something about health and life matters among girls, especially mental health, what we can do about it? I didn't hear anything you said. You broke up. I think that might be my internet giving me some trouble or it, it could be yours. I'll repeat. Uh, you know, somebody uh, on the chat asked a question that uh, I'm sorry I missed your name. Uh, that uh, can you say something about, you know, health and life matters for girls, especially mental health? Right. Um, generally, and all the research in the world suggests to us very strongly that this is the time children need um, more counseling, more than ever. The difficult years of adolescence and the confusing changes happening in their bodies. Um, and how to navigate those. Without a doubt, we need a robust and a more robust uh, application to girls than, than boys, although I believe boys also need interventions and help. With even more confusing issues arising um, that are more audible in the world, I don't wanna say more present, I believe they were always present, but perhaps more audible, on sexuality and um, how to identify and so on. I think it's even more important. Now, I don't know that countries, and I could speak specifically for mine, we haven't proportionately addressed um, with resources, the needs that are arising, the mental health needs that are arising. And so it has to be wended into almost education the way we treat education, go into a classroom and we teach for so many hours and we have X number of periods, or X number of topics, um, subjects per week. It has to be went into a condition that we have. We started and we held a health and family life education, HFLE, where we try to teach these life skills. But it is my view that especially in this pandemic period, a more strategic, directed, targeted intervention has to happen. And so we are working on a possible hotline. We've also collaborated with the Ministry of Human Services where they have now a direct hotline that one can call for gender-based violence. This is one of the few countries that started a Men's Affairs Bureau because I saw someone saying it that we have to uh, in, involve men in the conversation and force solutions on the issue of violence against women. And so when we had started that conversation somewhere around 2006, a very robust conversation, men said, but you're not talking to us about what the problems, what you, you're, you're talking about us and we are perpetrators, but you're not talking to us about what our issues may be and how we could resolve these together. Um, so on the issue of mental health interventions, however we style it or call it, because we should also accept that different countries have particular um, taboos against recognizing or, or accepting that there are mental health issues and that they come in various forms and fashions and, and different present themselves differently and manifest differently amongst um, different populations and different cultures, uh, that we need to well, make that almost a part of the curriculum. We have created for when we restart school, two diagnostics, an academic diagnostic to see where students are, 
and where we need to start back from, but a wellness diagnostic for all our students from nursery all the way through secondary to see how you feel about not having been in school, how you feel about coming back, how frightened are you, how can we help you to settle in again? Um, and we believe it's absolutely necessary to, as necessary as the academic work, to get that straight or everything else will be affected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. Now, I think we're running out of time and I don't see any questions um, over here. Uh, so uh, what I would do is I'll go around the panel uh, with this question, you know, that what is your one takeaway from the discussion? What, what was the kind of insight that you've taken away from this discussion? And what is your one recommendation? So from your perspective, what you thought was one insight and one recommendation for the audience. I'll start with Tony, then Honorable uh, Unity Dow, then Honorable Manik Chan, and then Francis Ferreira. So uh, Tony. Thank you, Prof. Um, I think we probably would all agree that the traditional schooling system was based on an industrial model and an assumption that all learners are the same, they must start in the same way, they must end in the same way, they must follow the same pathway. What we're realizing, I think, from this discussion is that every learner is unique. Every learner has slightly different challenges. And as I've said in the chat, my sense is that, especially for older learners, a blended approach could be a way of accommodating greater flexibility, greater personalization. Thank you. OK, so your recommendation is blended approach. Great. Uh, Dr. Dow? Thank you very much. My one takeaway, you know, that many, but one that comes to mind, listening to everybody, is that I think we all agree that we cannot uh, warehouse children for 13 years, open the doors when they are 18, you know, and expect them to be, you know, uh, rounded individuals without constantly engaging the community, constantly, um, yeah, bring a bridge between schools and communities. Um, that would be my one takeaway. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Honorable Priya Manikchan. For me, the opportunities that are presented with COVID was horrible and continues to be an awful, awful thing. But with it came uh, two things. One, a very strong demonstration, visible demonstration that we are a resilient people, the, the world is and human beings are, and two, that there are other ways we can teach and perhaps they will be more effective. I don't believe one or the other. I don't see us ever going back to one or the other. We will not do online alone, but I don't see us going back after this experience to just chalk and talk. Um, because like Tony says, it is very clear that we have opportunities here. So a treat with the diversity that we have in even one single classroom um, with so many different levels of learning and, and um, realities in each child's life. And I think it presents opportunities that we must not let go undocumented or unacted or we must implement post-COVID. Thank you. Francis? <clears throat> Thank you, Asiji. Yes, there, is so, there are so many things to take away from here. But I think if we want to bring girls back to school, for me, what I have heard, I think um, the most impressive uh, part that I would take away with me is the issue of spaces uh, highlighted by Dr. Dao uh, and the uniqueness of the girl and their experiences within those spaces and how to deal with it. But also to add to that and say, but for us to address this, we need to have a discussion with them and not about them. So to make a recommendation, I definitely think open schooling in its various types of models that we have in the different contexts can definitely be a solution. It is not the solution, but it can be part of the bigger picture. So I'm definitely 
for open schooling as part of the solution to bring girls back to school, working with communities. Thank you, Professor Kanwar. Thank you so much. I think this has been an excellent uh, discussion because we've uh, and nobody's really repeated the same things. I mean, everybody has complimented the whole issue. So now we are much better uh, aware and uh, this discussion has really been very illuminating from all perspectives from different regions and so on. And the two things which came out really, you know, during the pandemic for education, one was the issue of quality and the other was the issue of equity. And what uh, Honorable Manikchan said that, you know, uh, we have been fairly re resilient, but there have been gaps. So if we are looking for the future of education, we need to build resilient education systems that can withstand all future disasters. I mean, they will not withstand all future disasters. Those disasters have a way of getting the better of us, but they would be more resilient going forward. So I think many things will have changed as we move on. Equity becomes absolutely critical because even now, you know, the global education meeting which UNESCO held, you know, last week, and they had done a survey on what countries are doing to uh, reach the vulnerable groups. And you'll be surprised that only 9% of the countries reported taking one or more measures to support the education of the least vulnerable, which includes girls. So I think we need to do more in this area. It's not uh, even now, uh, we haven't really uh, taken care of this issue. But in conclusion, I mean, let me uh, quickly summarize the three policy implications uh, from this discussion. Uh, the first one is that conventional brick and mortar approaches will not bring more girls to school. Open distance and technology-based approaches, which are more flexible, which will allow them to study at their own convenience at a fraction of the cost. And this is not going to be either or, it's going to be blended approaches. And the other point which came out is how can we use distance learning approaches to provide the remedial classes to bring, you know, to take care of the learning loss. So that's the first. The second is that political will is very necessary because we are doing, we are talking about, you know, bicycles in this country, midday meals in another country, but these remain pilots unless we have the political will to scale and sustain them. And I'm glad we've got uh, two political heavyweights here with us. So how can we complete the circle from policy to implementation to measuring impact? And I think this has also come out in this presentation. It's very important to get the uh, data. And the final point is that we need to focus on building social capital. Empowered mothers and sensitized communities can be the most powerful stakeholders for ensuring that girls not only have access, but every opportunity for success. So what innovative ways of community engagement uh, can help us surmount the barriers that we have faced in these lockdowns and through tradition and through culture, so-called, so I think those were the three points which I wanted to highlight. And since we've run out of time, I want to thank you all, uh, our panelists, Honorable Dr. Unity Dow, Honorable Priya Manikchand, my colleagues, Tony Mays and Francis Ferreira and the invisible audience we've had. And of course, Adriana, who has been really the mainstay in organizing all that. Thank you, Adriana, just show your face for a minute. There she is. Thank you, Professor Asher. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. So thank you so much.